Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 2022 ILC Future of Aging Conference. I'm Martin Green, and I am the chair of the ILC, and I'm really delighted to welcome you all today to this, I think it's going to be a really useful and very interesting conference. Of course, it is the first um, uh, Future of Aging conference since the death of our founder and president, Baroness Sally Greengross. And as many of you know, she was the driving force behind the ILC movement right across the world, and particularly establishing the ILC in the United Kingdom. I was privileged to know Sally for a long time. In fact, um, when we were talking before she died, we realized we had worked together and been friends since 1986. So we can truly say that we went back a long way. Sally was an absolutely remarkable person. She is somebody who can make a claim which is absolutely true, that she not only had a national impact, but she had an international impact. Many of the things that we talk about today, Sally Greengross was the first person to raise them. You know, I think about the time in the 70s when Sally and her sister-in-law, Dr. Wendy Greengross, wrote Living, Loving and Aging, talking about sexuality, disability and age. The first time, really, that that issue had been aired on such a public, in such a public way. And that's something that has now taken a much higher profile and it was down to the work that she did. She also, of course, was very involved in the development of action on elder abuse, now called Hourglass. Sally understood the issues around uh, domestic violence and particularly around the issues around abuse and older people. And typical Sally, not only did she raise the issue, but she said, how are we going to do something practical to make sure that people have support. She was passionate about human rights, and that was a value that was riven through everything that she did. And I think, you know, we can be all very pleased that she really did not only take on issues, but found solutions and move the agenda forward. When Sally died, we saw so many tributes to her, and they were not only national, they were international. And they showed that she was a woman who was respected across the globe for all the things that she had achieved. Now, I went to see Sally shortly before she died, and it was very shortly before she died. And she wasn't talking about our 25th anniversary, though we're all very proud that we're in our 25th year. She wasn't even talking about her own achievements or indeed uh, the fact that she was facing the end. What she was talking about was the future. And for Sally, she was absolutely passionate about making sure that we lived in a world where the longevity dividend was delivered to everybody. She really understood that with changing patterns of longevity, this was not only about older people. It was about how we manage that across the life course and how we get the benefits of longevity right across the country and the globe. And so when she was talking to me, she said to me, there is so much still to do. And I said to her, well, you can rest assured that the ILC will be in the very vanguard of looking to the future and carrying on your mission and delivering on your legacy. And we all have so much to be thankful for in that she delivered a vision for a better world, and we now have the challenge to follow her example and to deliver some really tangible things in the future. One thing that I did notice when Sally died were the number of people who said wonderful things about her, and they were from across the globe and across political divides. Uh, the former Prime Minister, Sir Tony Blair, was going to do a, a video for us, and in fact he is going to do a video for us, but unfortunately it hasn't arrived uh, for this conference. But it will be available shortly on our website. And the fact that former Prime Ministers were queuing up to give Sally accolades is a real indicator of how much she achieved and how respected and listened to she was. 
So she has left us a great legacy, and we now need to take that legacy forward. Today's conference is going to be filled with, I think, some really interesting and very um, dynamic presentations. But the important thing about those presentations will not be the way in which they're presented. It will be the messages that they contain. And we are going at this conference to be seeing how we as a society deliver on the longevity dividend. And all our speakers are going to be really passionate about delivering on a future that is better than we have at the moment. And I know everybody in this room shares that vision. The ILC is really fortunate to have so many people who are committed to this vision, who are supporting us in various ways. And I want to publicly thank you all. Whatever you do, whether you're a funder, whether you're a supporter, whether you're an academic feeding in issues and research into our agenda, we could not deliver this agenda without you. And we are eternally grateful for everything that you are doing. There's a lot to do, but I am confident we will get there in the end. I now like to introduce our chief executive, David Sinclair. And David is going to run through some of the logistics of the event, and then we're going to start with the presentations. So, David, over to you. I'm not as tall as Martin. Um, th thanks, Martin. And, and really striking, of course, that it, it wasn't just Sir Tony Blair who contacted the office after Sally died, but Sir John Major, um, Prince Charles. We had an astonishing number of UK and global leaders who, who, who called and wanted to, to write to and contact, contact the family. Um, so, um, welcome. Thank you, thank you for joining us, uh, us here, here in London um, today. And, and for those of you joining us across the world, welcome. This time last year, we, had, um, we were joined. I don't think we told you at the day, but we, 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 um, we presented the, the conference was also streamed to Brazil about three hours later. So we had about 300 people sitting in a room in Brazil watching it as well. So, so, it, so, so our reach was pretty big last year. For those of you who don't know us, and I hope most of you do, we are the specialist think tank on longevity and its impact on society, and, and really want to, I suppose we exist to help society identify solutions and implement solutions to maximize the opportunities of longevity. And I'm going to do a bit of an intro, because um, uh, 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 I, I sort of want to reflect a bit around sort of opportunity, uh, uh, a bit, uh, to try and be a bit optimistic, because the world's a bit gloomy at the moment. So I thought I'd try and do some, a bit of positivity and think about what we've actually achieved and how things have, have changed over the last sort of quarter of a century or, or so. Um, so you, uh, I suppose I should firstly, and you know, I've already, f Lindsay said to me, you're going to forget to use the things, and I have. Um, so firstly, uh, I said I'm incompetent. Um, uh, firstly, a huge thank you to, to our sponsors, uh, our main sponsor here, Phoenix Group, who we're working very, very closely with. Um, um, for some reason, the slides are moving. Moving. Um, for first, first, uh, th thank our sponsors. Um, I'd, Phoenix Group would also like to thank Roche, uh, LV, UKRI Healthy Aging Challenge, the Institute and Faculty Ac of Actuaries, and the Centre for Aging Better for their support, sponsoring individual sessions. And of course, also like to thank the members of our partners program who support our work through through the whole year. And the staff team, of course, who without whom we would not be able to run the event today. Um, Martin's had to leave us, but our, our trustees have been a huge help to me and the staff team. And I am extraordinarily helpful to, uh, grateful to Martin and uh, the whole of the trustees and uh, for the support they've given me and the whole team over the past year, which, as you can imagine, has been a very, very difficult one for us. Um, during the course of um, today, we're going to be taking questions and comments on Slido. Um, and I have, a, I have an iPad there, so I can see your, your answers. Please, can I encourage you to have a look and try and log into that now? There is... Um, um, so, so there is... Uh, um, on the back of your badge, there is a, a QR code. You can click on that, and it will take you to Slido. And I'd encourage you to do that now, because I am going to ask you a few questions um, um, during the course of um, my session here at the beginning. Um, you can also log in directly for those of you who are online via via this link here. 
Um, so you go to sli.do.com and then you enter Future Beijing 2022 as a hashtag. Right, we've got a few of you doing it, I can see, which is great. Because one of the things that I was slightly worried about was only two people doing it, our poll being slightly awkward in terms of the response. So, so please, please do it on my polls. And I am, by the way, going to manipulate the answer to the first question. Um, but you will see how we're in a minute. Um, if you want to tweet about the event, please do using the hashtag Future of Aging and tag us in on at ILC UK. So I, I think, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll be aware that, or some of you will be aware that over the last six months or so, we've had this survey live of, um, uh, of what some of you think about the last 25 years and what you might think happened next. We, we didn't really want to do a representative survey. So we got about 100 people who came back and said what they thought about what was great, what was, what's changed, what, what hadn't changed. And God, they all, you're all a miserable lot, I have to say. Um, the, the tone was pretty dismal, you know, in terms of, you know, it wasn't a hopeful sort of sense of, you know, where we were. So from these slides, we no longer feel hopeful about the future, a sense of lost hope. Um, society's become more, more narcissistic and entitled. You know, real sense that, look, actually, the world, you know, that people were feeling pretty down about where we were in the world. So this is going to be my first question about whether you agree. And I'm not going to tell you what the quant's answer was to our survey, but, but um, there should be a poll on Slido that should be appearing, appearing now, um, hopefully. Can someone wave to indicate there is a poll that has... Um, that's appeared, yep, good. So there is a poll, and I'm going to come back to the answer, answer in a moment, so you've got a bit of time to, to do that. So when, when we asked people what they, um, what they said that they thought, um, um, uh, what, uh, when we asked people what they said they changed, people talked a lot about technology, but actually there wasn't very much of the framing of the changes since 1997 in a really positive way. So... Um, Actually, we asked people what technology they used in 97 that they don't use now, and one of the most common answers was typewriter, which is really striking to me, because I was around in 1997, and I don't remember anyone using a typewriter in 1997. Um, the only typewriter I can remember, remember is the one in the 1990s remake of David Burroughs' Naked Lunch, um, which was a very strange typewriter completely, but actually that we were not using typewriters. So it's really striking in some ways that our memory of what 1997 was is in somewhat classic. Um, uh, we also asked people what they thought the next 25 years might look, and you know you may not be surprised to say the answers were even more dispiriting than the past. Um, most people don't think we're better off than we were 25 years ago, and even fewer think we're better off. We'll be better in the next. So let's have a look at where we've got to into in terms of the, your results for that first question. Uh, can we have the results come up? Okay, so we have 71%. Oh, that's good. 71%. You are not representative of the survey we did before, <laughs> I have to say. 71% um, of you think we were better off than we were tw tw 25 years ago. Seriously, you are much more positive um, than, the, than the group. It was about four people, I think, who thought we were better off in our other survey. So, so that's, that's a good start. Um, um, so, so, yeah, let, if we go back to the, 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 the slides then, the main slides... Um, so, so, yeah, when you think about the future, actually people were even more dismal. I see no chance of things getting better. The UK is falling apart. Time is bleak. All this grimness is understandable. Um, and it is sort of understandable. You know, we've seen over the last 25 years cuts to education, real-time cuts, 70% cuts to youth services. The Barnet Graph of Doom, some of you will remember, was um, a, 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 a something that came out from Barnet which suggested within the next 10 years now, so 20 years at the time, local authorities would only be spending money on social care, that basically they would not have, be able to spend money on anything else. Um, we have huge skills gaps in the economy, and we're going to talk about that le later. We have younger people actually missing out on real-term growth in their incomes um, for the first time in a long, long time, floundering economy, climate change, conflict, growing levels of poverty, pension of poverty likely to increase. So anyway, there's my negative stuff. I'm going to get onto the positive stuff now, because actually I do want us to, to try and sort of frame today in, you know, where what Martin was saying around uh, solutions and, and opportunities. 
um, uh, and um, uh, um, um, uh, uh, for, the, for the future. So, and whilst I'm going to be rambling, it gives you a chance to think about the next question, which was, are we going to be... Um, um, oh, sorry, we're much better off now. Okay, I feel we might... So, so anyway, I was, uh, this, that's the same question we had a minute ago, isn't it? Sorry, uh, the slide, I'm not sure what's going on the slides. Okay, here we are, futures. Um, I do know what I'm doing, I promise. Um, uh, uh, so, so as a society, we'll be better off in 25 years, so you can have a think about whether you think we're going to be better off whilst I'm sort of doing a bit of a rambling intro. Um, uh, and I'm going to argue we, we, we are significantly. So if you look across the world, life expectancy at birth has increased from 66 to 73. That's seven years additional life expectancy in just 25, which is a massive, massive growth. Um, we've seen huge innovations in, in health, whereas life expectancy rates were previously driven by falling mortality in the young, pre-water vaccination. Now the growth is a result of increase, reducing the likelihood we die post, post 60. And we've witnessed pretty much the elimination of polio. More people are surviving cancer and a HIV diagnosis can have the same life expectancy. People with HIV diagnosis can have the same life expectancy as the population as a whole. This is unthinkable 25 years ago. Camera and government put dementia on the world stage. We've got a vaccine against malaria and HPV, developing one against HIV. COVID vaccines developed in just one year saved 20 million lives in a year. We've seen huge, huge developments, massive openness about mental health, which we didn't have 25 years ago. And we've got, you know, despite the world of fake news, we have organisations like NICE and JCVI in the UK who actually are leading the way in terms of evidence-based policy making around health. And we have more of us who are born with a disability living into old age. You know, there were some huge successes around health, massive innovations in food, allowing to us, eat, us to eat healthier and better. And for those who remember 1997, um, like me, you know, we started the process of banning sports. So smoking adverts in sport were started to be banned in 1997. And then we quickly saw bans on smoking in public places. We aren't far from further restrictions on smoking, I suspect. And we're seeing New Zealand, for example, making smoking illegal for anyone under, I think it's 21 now, and then it'll be 22 the following year. Uh, and we'll get there as well. Um, and, and, and I think we think the public demand for prevention has reached this tipping point and policy and spending will reflect that soon. Of, of course, with, you know, we're particularly interested in equalities and diversity in the context of longevity. And um, in 1997, just around one in 10 parliamentarians were female. Now it's over a quarter and it's increased every year and continue to increase. We had our first Muslim MP in 97. We now have 18. And attitudes to gender and sexuality and race completely transformed. And there are lots of older couples. We did some interesting work on older and younger LGBT communities a, a, a while back. Actually spent a big part in their lives in a country where homosexual acts were illegal. You know, we've, you know, the changes you've seen over the last quarter century have been huge. In, in the US in 1997, it's notable. 70% um, of people, and I didn't you create the words here in the poll, 70% of people in the US in 1997, 7 in 10 said same-sex marriage shouldn't be valid, and today it's 28%. Now, we would argue 28% is still far too high, but actually that's a massive drop in, in, in the US. We've had an Equalities Act that has put age on the same footing as other protected characteristics. We've made it illegal to kick people out of work just because they reached a certain age. Age just isn't relevant in the same way as it was. Um, we've got, frankly, you know, and we can argue about this later, the best music we've had for decades. And this year we had, we had Brian May this year at 75 with Roger, uh, Roger Taylor from Queen playing 10 nights at the O2 just a couple of days before Billie Eilish did four or five days at the age of 19. You know, we've got this age is just nowhere near as relevant as it, as it was, which is extraordinarily valuable. And we're also in a world where, you know, the... Actually, we, you know, the non-traditional family models are looked at in a much more positive way. Just look at the John Lewis advert and the way it's portrayed foster care, for example. 
we've seen the introduction of parental la leave. Paternity leave will have a huge impact on care and our attitudes towards it. And initiatives like the Carers Leave Bill, which people like Phoenix and ILC are being supported of, which basically gives carers the right to um, unpaid, unpaid leave, seems extraordinarily, you know, a, a common sense approach and is, is absolutely the next step. And I think we've got Saga here in the room, but, you know, Saga have also introduced grandparental leave. So, you know, there's some really good, pro good things we're doing. Um, last year, you know, wealth, you know, we, we didn't have a minimum wage in 97. We didn't, we've, since then, we've introduced a minimum wage and a living wage. We've pulled a billion people globally out of poverty. Back then, we sort of accepted that in old age, you were inevitably more likely to be poor in old, uh, poorer than you were now, and we don't accept that anymore. We introduced pension credit. Uh, Auto-enrollment led to millions more people saving. And 25 years ago, we used to say to older people, and actually people in their 50s, people my sort of age, we used to say, good of the economy, you need to quit now. Um, you know, the mid-90s, we were still saying to people, you know, there is an economic case for, for, for people in their 50s to leave the, leave the workforce early. And, we're, and now we're saying, well, actually, older workers are driving the economy. Paul, Paul highlighted a story yesterday where I think Halfords are now looking for 10,000 people to, um, tell 10,000 older workers to fix bikes. You know, uh, there, there is huge demand for older workers. And in terms of measuring wealth, even the World Economic Forum and the big financial services companies think we need to be looking at alternatives. So, you know, we have moved on to, um, moved on in terms of wealth. And then, see how far I'm going. Um, I'll, I'll try and be, I'll be very brief. Um, um, tech, the world of tech's changed. We have tin openers that work. Um, <laughs> you know, the, 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 you, you people born in 2000 won't understand this. But we have tin openers where we went back a bit with digital switchover with two remote controls, but actually universal design, see we've got Colin here, is now mainstream. Um, tech can help me healthy. I can go running against someone in Japan and New York on a, on a running machine. Um, and we can bring together people in a way we, we never have before. Um, uh, you know, it can bring together people with niche interests, sometimes seen as a bad thing, but for those of you like me who are fans of the 90s power pop jelly f band Jellyfish, we can talk about why they split up 25 years on. You know, there is platforms now for us all to engage with, with our interests. Um, and we've automated some really, really terrible jobs. You know, um, um, and, you know, for those of us, you know, clearly concerned about climate change, we did manage to repair the ozone layer. So, you know, I can, you know, we, let's debate this age. I can check on whether my kids got to school by tracking her on an app. Um, actually, she loves this because it means I don't phone every five minutes to check where she is. You know, this tech is brilliant. Um, it's facilitated hybrid work working. Delivery means that when I get to Meals on Wheels, I can have more choice than I ever have before. Um, online shopping means I can buy anything I want and get it delivered immediately. It's amazing. The world's great. You know, I don't know what you're all complaining about. Um, <laughs> And, and, you know, finally, the young people are really are smarter than ever before. And I think, uh, you know, and this is, I think, the real hope. Younger people are wiser, more connected, more passionate, more incredible. Um, and actually, this is good in a world where, where more of us are older. My, again, am I, I suspect my 10-year-old isn't representative, but at 10, he was, she was watching um, um, YouTube clips on North Korea and the history of North Korea. Um, you know, astonishing sort of access to information. Um, we've seen more and more people getting a degree. Going to university is brilliant. And, and I know one of our speakers later is going to talk a bit about the challenges of this. Um, schools are getting better at practical uh, subjects. You, we can do, as well as GCSEs, we can do design or health and social care qualifications as we go through, go through school. And for those of you who want to go to university, the courses now, seriously, have a Google of the courses you can do. I could do circus skills. I probably won't. Um, but I could also do ethical hacking. I quite like the idea of that. But Although when I was doing this, um, we've got Stuart coming up, I was Googling, when I was Googling this, it came, it came up with the option of coolest degrees, and one of its suggestions was actuarial science. And, and while of us are all here, no actuaries are cool. It's something I didn't realize everyone else did. Um, I'd say, you know, YouTube, seriously, if you also want, if you're bored one evening, also look, at, try to find a random subject that you can't learn on YouTube. And I spent a good 10 minutes saying, I now know how to cut bananas from trees, I can do all sorts of things. You can learn anything you want from, from tech now. And of course, back in 97, we only had four TV channels from Telestrial, you know. We didn't even have Channel 5, not that that's added a huge amount to our, uh, to our collective knowledge. Um, 
And then I'm going to finish with, you know, our communities really are nice. The independent bookshops are making a nice, uh, nice uh, comeback. We've gone from government talking about the great car economy to redesigning our cities for active travel. Older people are driving the sales of e-bikes. This morning I could have got on a scooter and gone from... Um, um, gone from the hotel over here, and the, uh, and I wanted to do because I thought, oh, that'd be cool, me turning up on the scooter, um, on the little scooter. But the main reason is this bloody watch is telling me I had to do the steps, you know. Uh, the, um, so, so you know, the, 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 our city micro mobility is going to change the way that our communities work, and it will work better for older people than others. The people who struggle to get around ten, town centres are going to really benefit from some of the innovations in town centres. Um, and to be honest, politics isn't even isn't all that bad. You know, the, the devolved administrations in Wales and Scotland means decisions are made by people who know what they need. The amazing work being done by Manchester is fantastic. And we've got thousands of people of all ages willing to be public servants. And I think, you know, as someone who's worked in public affairs for uh, a long time, politicians definitely get a bad stick. But in the 25 years of meeting them, I haven't met anyone who wants to make the world worse. And I think there is something we just need to reflect on, on there. So, so wh you know, what, what, does, what does all this mean? You know, uh, I think the one thing I can't promise is the price of Quality Street will be in 25 years or the size of the box, um, given some of you will have seen the si how the size has declined. But actually, if you then look into a little bit more detail, what you will see is actually the cost is about the same as it was 25 years ago. It's actually much cheaper than it was. So all of you complaining about the smaller Quality Street, it's, it's not ev even that's a, a win. We're not paying more for our Quality Street. Um, and, and as advocates, we've spent a huge amount of time over the last 25 years complaining about things going wrong. And, and I think it probably is about time for us to sort of think about how we focus on the solutions and how we think about our narrative in the context of, look, actually, just telling people stuff isn't working isn't getting us very far. So let's think about how we redesign social care or redesign technology or redesign help to, to make it work. I think the final point, you know, it's great, you know, working with people like, um, like Phoenix is that we've got more options than we ever had before to influence. Um, we have Patagonia giving their company away. We have um, Timpsons doing amazing work. We have Phoenix and Legal and General. We have companies actually interested in social change. And I think, you know, this is extraordinarily, impos extraordinarily positive. So, um, so I'm going to stop there because I've gone over, as, as I thought I might. But, um, and let's see whether or not you're as optimistic about where we're going to be in the future. So I wonder if we could see the results of the slide. So yeah, you know, uh, you're, again, you're much, much more positive than than our than our unrepresentative sample. And maybe we should put this out to a proper poll. So anyway, okay, thank you very much. That was my sort of brief. Let's be all positive. Um, now it gets, it gets a bit dismal from now on. Sorry, um, but I do hope all of our speakers will focus on on solutions and and where we're going to be going.